Hey, I'm Russell Leeds, and welcome to the Property Investors Podcast. On this week's show, we're going to be discussing the biggest mistakes that newbie property investors make. So I've brought with me someone who knows all about making mistakes, uh, James <laughs> Yule. Thank you, you for that introduction, Russell. Thank you. I'm good at you. That is all right. No problem. Well, yeah. They always say, don't they, you, you know, you either... You either learn from making mistakes or you learn from someone else's mistakes. Correct. So I thought, bring James on the show. Let everybody learn from my mistakes. He's made every mistake in the book. <laughs> I mean, look at the haircut for a start. <laughs> um, so I thought, you know, you'd be a great person to bring yeah. on for this week. Thank you, mate. Thank you. So we've made a list. We've sat down. We've made a list of what we believe to be the top 10 mistakes that beginner property investors make. And while property investing can be incredibly lucrative and is obviously a fantastic way of making money you can lose a lot of money as well if yep. you make some of these mistakes yes definitely so I, I think it's well worth well worth going yeah. through them anyway. I'm sure you've lost some money as well Russell um, I actually have lost money on one investment that I've made I've lost money on but it wasn't wasn't we really are even property. Stevens I'm on one you're You're on a big one but one still the same, so... Uh, mine wasn't much. I've lost three and a half grand. <clears throat> what was that way? So it, was, it what kind of was property. It was, uh, it was a company that offered... It was a crowdfunding company. And they were, they were doing like, you know, you'd put a bit of money in. I was sort of doing, I was doing it more of an experiment, but you kind of put a bit of money into it and Did then they give you like a 12% return on your money. You put the money in then? I put the money in. It worked for years <sighs> and I was getting my money back. So I say I've lost three and a half grand... I probably made, I didn't, wasn't putting big amounts in. I, had, I was playing with about 15 grand, just experimenting with it. I probably made that three and a half grand in interest over the years. But right. then suddenly, suddenly I noticed, because I had lots of deals on there, and I noticed that a lot of the deals were like late paying back. And I thought, hmm, that's a bit of a red flag. Mm. Um, you know, they were like, oh, this deal's not, and it's like not even a bit late, like six months, a year late. I was thinking, they can't keep mm. going like this. So I tried to pull all my money out. Yeah, I got about ten grand out, and then suddenly the company went bankrupt. I'd really? left about five in, and then over the years, every now and again, they release yeah. a little tiny bit more money. So I might get it back. That's a lesson for being lazy and not investing yourself, really, isn't it? So that's, that's the first. There's, there's <laughs> eleven now. Eleven. You know, don't be lazy. Yeah. is rule number one. <laughs> All right, well, let's move on to the real number one, stroke number two. Um, and this, interestingly, is probably the opposite of what most people think, but it is the biggest mistake that I actually see. And it's people are too cautious mm. trying to find the perfect deal. Yeah, I, I used to do this a lot. And I still do it a little bit because when you get a couple of like real banging deals, you then everything else has got to live up to that, ain't it? And it's difficult to always find a banging deal, especially when um, the market's so up and down. It's you can never replicate it, can you? No. Uh, or it's difficult to anyway. Uh, but yeah, I, I'd say I, I'm I'm guilty of that. Um, being too to, cautious. Yeah, trying to what? find the perfect deal. But that's that goes back to when you're being bit, doesn't it? Because if you've been bit a little bit. Sometimes then you're like, Ooh, I don't want that to happen again. But sometimes you've got to remember that, you know, if you look at just the average properties, I always remember this sort of <coughs> stuck with me when I first went to the Property Investors Crash Course, which uh, obviously Samuel runs. And he said, if you literally blindfolded some, anyone here, picked a random person, blindfolded you. Get locked up for that. Took you on a train, yeah, yeah. Took you on a train station, took, put you on any train. You got off at any stop, blindfold still on. You were like, where's, where's, the, uh, where's the nearest estate agent? They took you to the estate agent. They said, right, you at the window. You went, uh, I want that one, please. And you pointed at a random house in a random city. You didn't know where you were. You're absolute newbie. That would probably still be a good investment over time. Yeah, I'd probably, agree with that, yeah. It'd probably still go up in value, Yeah, right? you'd be able to do something with it, wouldn't you? You would. You yeah. would. Now, to be fair, when he said this, interest rates were a little bit lower. So mm -hmm. you'd have probably made good cash flow from it as well. Mm -hmm. Maybe not so much right this second, although that is changing kind of as we speak yeah um but basically any property you buy is going to be good now here's the thing though the biggest mistake you can make is actually not buying the property because if you let's say you wait a year trying to find the perfect deal mm. you've lost out on a year's worth of rent yeah you've lost out on a year's worth of capital appreciation yeah you, you know all all the time you could be making money putting your money to work instead yeah. it's shrinking in the bank yeah we see this happen regular don't we with people we're waiting for the right time to invest in property when's that 
Well, the best time was 20 years ago. Exactly. The second best time is right now. Yeah. 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 So don't be too cautious. Now, mm. we're going to cover the opposite of that later on <laughs> in the show. But the first thing is, if you, if you kind of, if you've done your due diligence and you know, don't be messing around. Oh no, there's, there's this problem, there's that problem. Just do it. Yeah. And the other thing is, not only will you start making money from it straight away, but you'll learn from other mistakes that you've made and stuff as you go. Whereas yeah. if you don't take any action, Every day is a school day. Yeah. Yeah. And I think when you, when you get so far into a deal that even if it's not the most lucrative deal, you're going to make it work. Or if it, if it can, you're going to make it work. Um, <clears throat> and you're going to learn yourself a lot along the way. Like I say, it's, you know, it's, there's no better way of learning than actually doing. Have you ever not bought a deal where you thought, ah, oh, I messed up there? Um, yeah. Uh, last year, HMO on the market... Mm -hmm. And it went next door but one to a HMO that gave me a 13,500% ROI. 13 and a half. That sounds quite a lot. It is a lot. It's, uh, technically, it was infinite. But when we refinanced it, we left £186 in the deal. Something like £186. And it cash flowed net around 24 grand a year, give or take a few. Um, and when I worked here, I had about 13,500% ROI we got. So anyway, next door but one came up for sale. Very similar money, same house as good as it's a row of terraced houses. Um, but this was the end terrace, so it was slightly bigger because it was a bit different shape. And I was like, yeah, we'll buy it. And then something else came up, a little bit bigger project. And I thought, mm, I want that one actually. So then this deal, I gave it to my good wife's best friend who were trying to get into property. Right. And I gave them this deal. They took us out for dinner just as a thank you. And they have made the same money off that that I made off mine. And the deal that I let it go for fell through. So then I was watching them build this house thinking, why didn't I just take that deal? Yeah. I knew it worked. I knew we could have made money. And then I took a risk to try and get a little bit of bigger house and it fell through. It all fell through. So maybe you were too cautious and you should have, should have just gone for both Do deals. Both, exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, I've overlapped multiple projects before, but we just wanted a little bit of a breather because we'd just come out of like three. So I'm like, well, that's just a one. Uh, this time and then and then do and try and do a bigger one yeah so that was the that was the reason why we went to go for the bigger one which would have been like a 12 bed hmr um and that fell through due to planning um and then by that point they'd already started the refurb on this house that i knew were going to work and now it's finished and fully tenanted and competing with my hmo next door but one yeah crazy <laughs> well the thing is even if like even if it wasn't like the best deal in the world i bet you've never looked back at a deal and gone oh we stretched ourselves too thin doing that you know, oh, uh, you never do. You always no. look back and go, oh, it's well worth it. Yeah. <clears throat> you look back and stuff you bought. Yeah, so happy I did. Yeah. So, yeah. Number one, too cautious, definitely. And obviously, James, like we said, the master of making mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, number two, um, and this is kind of the opposite now, is, and uh, this is another trait. This will depend on the sort of person that you are, right? So if you're, some people are perfectionists. And they want to get the perfect deal. Number one will have hit them really hard. A lot of other people will fall into this trap of being too optimistic. Mm. Do you know those people that always think they found yeah. the perfect deal? Yes, I think you see this more regular than the other one, if I'm honest. Yeah. Me personally, I'm not that guy. I'm a bit of a pessimist when it comes to the deals, looking for a perfect deal. Uh, but yeah, I've seen this happen a lot where people like are stretching the numbers straight away and you think, nah. Yeah. That's not right. They're like, oh, it would easy, easy rent out for yeah. you know two grand a month. You're like, really? Yeah. Six bed HMR conversion, thirty gram refurb. Mm, sure. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, have it, I'll have it valued. It'll be worth a million. <laughs> yeah. It'll be worth a million. How much is it today? Hundred grand. Yeah. <laughs> How much are you planning on spending on it? Oh, there, ten fifteen. 15. Lick yeah. of paint. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, the lenders will accept that. Yeah. <laughs> so so a lot of people are very optimistic, and in particular, I find in in three ways. Way number one is they think the property will be worth more than it would. Mm. Number two is they think the works, kind of touched on this, but the works will be cheaper yep. than, than they will. And number three is they think they'll get more rent or a higher occupancy. Let's say they're doing a service accommodation. They're like, 
they get the, over the absolute top whack rent yeah. and then work it out at 90% occupancy yeah. or something. Yeah. yeah. With no cleaning fees. With no cleaning <laughs> fees. Yeah, they forget about, no stamp duty. What's stamp yeah. duty? Yeah. You know, Booking fees, what are they? Yeah. So you always want to be doing things like taking into consideration voids, mm. taking into consideration maintenance. Yeah. You know, things like these, which it sounds like, oh, it sounds silly, but are we allowed 10% for both of those? Well, if you're making 20% profit, that's your profit gone. Mm. You know, so it's, it's taking these things into consideration. This is especially important when you're doing a joint venture as well, I think. Because especially if you are doing the work and the investor's putting the cash in and you're playing with somebody else's cash, you've got to be super, super realistic with them numbers. And I think if you overpromise an investor, even if it's still cash flowing good and they'd have accepted them numbers at day one, if you promise something else and, it, and that doesn't happen, yeah. they're always going to think, mm. Or if you're selling the deal. It's like, it's yeah, a good yeah. deal without the exaggeration, mate. You, yeah. didn't need, you didn't need to exaggerate, yeah. When so, I first started, I did that. What's over-exaggerated? Slightly on some numbers, and I rung the investor up, and then I went back to him and he says, do you know what? He says, if you'd have given me them numbers originally, I'd have bought the deal. He says, but I've lost trust in you now. And that was a hard lesson to learn. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So again, we're learning from James's <laughs> mistakes. I only make the mistake once, though. That's good. Well, that's the key is, <laughs> yeah. right? We're so afraid of making mistakes. Mistakes are fine as yeah. long as you learn from yeah, it. Yeah, definitely. Uh, number three is um, not doing proper due diligence. How many people don't do their proper due diligence when they're buying a deal? Yeah. Um, you see, again, you see this a lot where the numbers, they've, their outgoings a year, you know, they've, they've missed the council tax, they've missed the licensing, they've missed the cleaning fees, they've underestimated the gas, they've not looked at what prices properties are fetching on that street. Mm. They've looked at three miles away. And you'll know yourself, we can drive three miles down road and it's a completely different area. The house might be the same style and size, but the value is completely different. Yeah, they've cherry-picked the ones that are worth a lot yeah. nearby to, 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 uh, yeah. to give them this inflated end value. Yeah, and, and this all goes back to over-promising as well, doesn't it, in some ways? Yeah. Um, but or it could, it could even be just as simple as there's stuff wrong with the property that you weren't aware of, mm -hmm. right? So it's doing your proper due diligence on, on the property, why the person's selling. Mm -hmm. um, you don't want to be left with a lemon, especially if you're buying from auction. Yeah, I don't like auction. So have you, give us an example of a time where you didn't do your proper due diligence. <clears throat> um, I wouldn't say I've got a time on that one. I think that's a I'm sure. I'm sure you will. No. I think... I'm pretty sure I remember only, you telling me about a roof that you didn't the notice. Only, no, the only one I would say comes close is one that we spent money on doing plans for... Um, it were a large HMO. We were buying a big detached house. It were, it were falling to bits. Not falling down, technically, but it were falling to bits. So we knew it needed a high refurb. Um, we paid for plans from the architect doing. Uh, he started to submit planning because we were going to turn it into, a, I think, a seven or eight bed HMO. And then we got a surveyor out who found subsidence. Mm. And <clears throat> obviously subsidence... So did you get it? Did you, would you say it. you got it in the wrong order? You should have done the surveys first? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so you yeah. didn't do your property We were, we were the overconfident on it. Yeah. Um, we were like, this is definitely going to work, because it was good money. It was mm. cheap, and we were like, don't matter what it needs, you know, if we have to do everything, it's fine. We're going to earn money off this one. Plus that we were going to get planning permission to build another house at the side, which we would have got. It were a big enough plot. So we'd got a big cushion with that because we knew there were about 70 to 80 grand profit in that. On the land. Yeah. Um, but then by the time we'd done looking at the subsidence issue and things, it were eating into them profits. And then if we'd have only made 60 grand on that house, we'd have been even further down. So... We, we then had to swallow the, the big pill of losing about two, two and a half grand um, to come away from it. Yeah. So So you did do due diligence, you just didn't do it probably when you should. In the right order. Yeah. Yeah, we, we should have got the survey done first. So can we still kick that down as a James mistake for not doing your due diligence? <clears throat> um, I'm sure I called you about that, Russell, and asked you what to do when you said, just get, just get planning on it first. Oh, I don't remember this conversation. It doesn't, doesn't sound like the sort of thing I'd say. So three <laughs> out of three. All right. Um, here's a big one, especially right now because it, the market's been so stable for so long. 
Uh, number four, getting caught out when the market changes. Now, the markets obviously can it has been stable change. for long, hasn't it? Been stable for like since what 2008? <coughs> well, sort of after that, I don't know when, when it sort of stabilized. Well, I'd say it's, it's gone up obviously a little since then, hasn't it? But there's been no drastic changes recently. Well, the, well, the big one, obviously, uh, up until the, the mortgage changes, right? So, all these people yeah. have got buy to lets, but it also could be law. I tell you, there's two I can think of where people have been caught out badly. The first one was um, when they changed the law so you couldn't count your mortgage interest as a... Section... Section 24. 20, 24, yeah. yeah. So where you couldn't count your mortgage interest as If it's a, in your own name. If it's in your own name. So yeah. you've got all these landlords that have got properties that are... Uh, it'll be you one of them. First one I bought before I got trained. Okay, there you go. So you've got yeah. all these landlords... Another mistake. So you've got, <laughs> so you got all these landlords that have got these properties in their personal name. Suddenly yeah. Section 24 comes out and bang, they're actually losing money. Yeah. All of a sudden. So the market's changed and they weren't... They weren't we didn't lose money. Well, you could lose money. But we lost a little bit of profit. Yeah. But you, you could literally be... If, if it had been a single buy to let, we would have definitely lost money. Yeah? Yeah. So there's a lot of landlords out there being nailed with that. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. So, but and then the other one where it's changed, and I almost feel like the first one. To be fair, it was hard to prepare for that one. I mean, like the government have changed the legislation. If you didn't know, you didn't. How, how could you pre prepare for it? But one where I think people got caught out and they should have prepared for it was the interest rates going up. Yeah, I mean, it, it were obvious they were going to go up. They could only go one way, you know, unless banks started giving us money to buy houses. Did it go down to a quarter percent the base rate at one point? Something like that. It's very low. Two, isn't five, it? Yeah. Weren't it? So it are always going to go one way. So yeah, I think people who've over leveraged at that point and not fixed in long enough, they deserve what they get. See, the thing is, though, <laughs> I, I, I kind of respect people that that use leverage a lot. But you're right. Oh you, yeah, I, I use leverage. Yeah, but you don't want to over leverage. No, you've. I mean, all my deals. I'm looking at the realistically. If the if the base rate went up to ten percent, I'd still be in the green. Just. Mm. Um, but I've you've got to have some cushion on it, haven't you? I think that people who've leveraged the debt and and pulled seventy five percent out when it were at a half a percent, point two five percent. And they've just hoped that it's going to stay at that. It's not, is it? I mean, what are we at now? Five, has it gone down a 5% at the minute, the base rate? 5.25. Uh, I thought it had dropped from that to 5. No. Uh, has it dropped? Yeah, it might have done might actually. Have yeah, 5.25 to 5. To five, yeah. yeah. But, but it's um, going to come down, you're right. It's going to come down again to 4.75. They predict they by predict, the end of this but year. Then my mortgage broker predicting it were going to go back up. Obviously, nobody knows, do they? No. Um, but I think you've, you've got to leave enough meat on the bones that as it fluctuates up and down a little bit. I tell you what I, I think we do know, though. I think I would be absolutely stunned if over the next three to five years it's not significantly lower than it is now. Hope so. I'd be shocked if it's not. What do you think it'll settle at? I don't know. But I, I, I think it's going to come down to, I think, at least half over the next three to five years. Hmm. I think it's going to seriously come down. And one of the reasons I think that is because that if you fix your mortgages on a longer term rate, it's cheaper yeah. than a short term rate. Yeah. Which indicates, bear in mind, that they're, they're, they don't want to they don't want to give you really cheap mortgages for a long time when if, if the interest rates are going to go up. Yeah. Right? So normally it's the way around. Yeah. It's been so cheap because I think it might go up. Now thinking, this started happening now. about eight months ago, didn't it? Just less than a year ago, where they were, yeah. they were changing it. Probably was about five a year ago, two yeah. Because I remember we were going to refinance one, and when he sent me products through, I was like, "Why is it cheaper to fix for five years?" And they were like, "Well, why do you think?" Because it's coming said, down. Ah, it's going to come down. Yeah. What did you we still fix for? for five years. We did as well. I tell, yeah. you, I, I tell you why. <laughs> I tell you why I did though. You sleep better, don't you? If it's earning money, and it's, it's earning sleep. money at that rate, yeah. and I'm thinking. Five yeah. years, because it could in the meantime... I may be I, dead I, in five years. No. Yeah. So at least I'm earning some money for the next five years. Exactly that, exactly that. Um, so getting caught out when it changes, interest rates in particular, maybe new legislation, keeping an eye. So for example, I'll give you another example of something else that might change. It's keeping an eye on it and being aware. Um, new legislation might come out for service accommodation units. Mm. So don't be shocked. Don't wait for it to come out. Because they always give you warning. It's not like it suddenly happens yeah. and there's nothing you can do. They're talking about it now. They've been talking about it for a while, haven't they? Yeah, keep an eye on it and see what. Yeah. I, and make sure that you're set up. So if you've got units, uh, in fact, let's move on to the next one. It kind of links. Number five, 
no exit strategy, always have a plan B. Mm. So let's say, let's say you're renting out a service accommodation, you're buying something for service accommodation. I would want to know when I bought that, it also worked as a buy-to-let. I think the lenders would as well, wouldn't they? Because well, the lenders are not daft. They would, if and, you're, and, they would if you're buying it with a mortgage. Yeah. What about if you're buying it with bridging? Well, bridging, they'll let you buy anything, wouldn't they? What about if you're buying, it's your first property and you're buying it to live in yourself? To live in yourself? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you've, you've got to have a plan B with it, haven't you? Um, and if, if you're not going to at least break even, plus a little bit of profit as a single let, then maybe you need to rethink that, that deal. Yeah, or it might be that they turn around to you with the stress test and they go, well, look, we'll, we'll lend to you, but you need to put more in. And you go, mm. yeah, all right, that's fine. I've got the money, I'll put it in. But it's like, if they're worried, you should be worried. Yeah. That's my, I always think that, you know, people that are trying to lie to the mortgage brokers or whatever to try and fit it. Yeah. In, and it's like, if, if they're concerned, yeah, you, you should, should be, be concerned. <laughs> They're concerned. They're not concerned just for the hell of it. They're yeah. concerned because they think if this doesn't work as service accommodation, then we need to make sure it works as a buy to let. And if yeah. you're like, oh no, but it will work as a have a have a plan B. Yeah, yeah. Um, and don't be, you don't want to be sort of so over leveraged. Going back to our previous mm. point, that you have to sell stuff. It's like, oh, I have to sell this now because now I'm losing money on this, and I'm like, oh, I'm stuck and I yeah. can't. Re-. You know, you want to be in a situation where. You know, you're not planning to fail, but if you if it doesn't go exactly to plan, yeah, you need a plan B. What's your plan B? Yeah, no, I'd I'd agree with that definitely. We've got some service accommodation units, and I know the property would work as a single let, um, but hopefully, if they do bring some planning legislation out, there's gonna be some sort of grandfather rights that we can claim for service for service accommodation. Yeah, well, that's what they've said. Yeah, so like obviously we. We Article 4, we HMOs, as long as you can prove historical use. Um, so they're doing something with a tax with that as well at the minute, aren't they? With which one? With serviced accommodation. I think I saw something recently. I don't know if it were just one local council that's trialled it or, or a few, um, where you had to prove that you got 180 days worth of use for them to give you the... Lo- uh, the um, different tax not council tax what's business it called rights. business rates yeah to prove that you've got business rates so you had to get like you had to prove that you'd let it out for 100 it might have been 186 days or something um, and then they'd allow you to claim business rates yeah because you can collect obviously it's cheaper and often than, than the council yeah, tax true. so yeah it makes it does make sense if you can yeah so it just makes me wonder if they're going to do that with the um, with the if the C5 it so they might say yeah we'll let you turn it to C5 but we need to show that you need to show us that it's actually working as a service accommodation. Yeah. Um, well, which under the next six days is not much to prove, is they it? They haven't given us any sort of definition. The only thing that they've said right now is if its sole purpose is service accommodation, you can change the class. Yeah. Under grandfather rights. Yeah. But that was conservatives. La- Labour in now. Who knows? They might they might rewrite the rule book completely, and, and none of this has actually happened yet. It's all talk. It, nothing. It might it might be five years before this comes. I think in. we'll be at least. I think we'll be five years before anything happens. Do you? Yeah. I don't. I don't I, think no. It's gone, even gone in as white paper yet in Parliament, has it? I I think it will come in sooner than that. You think? Because I think that their Labour are really on this sort of stuff. But you might be right, and, and I've, I don't know. It's just it's purely a guess. All right, uh, number six. This is a mistake. I've never made this mistake, and I would hope, to be fair, James, that you've never made this mistake, but you you, you might surprise me. <laughs> um, but this is a Only mistake. Only once, if I have. I see all the time. And the, I think the only reason I didn't make this mistake, actually, was because of my previous business experience. Right, so if you're new to business, this is a mistake that so I hope many I am now, because I have previous business experience. Make. So. Well, I bet you didn't make this mistake. And it's jumping into a joint venture without clarity. No. You've not done that? No, I've not. And I've done a few joint ventures. Um, that said, I also tell people when they ask me about doing joint ventures, um, because I've done, I've done quite a few now, um, and they're always structured slightly different depending on what you and the investor want. But can I ask you a question before you go into it? Mm. Right. The, I bet the first way I think you probably won't have messed up by the fact you've done quite a few joint ventures. A lot of people, they set up joint ventures where it's kind of like, oh yeah, we're we're just doing serviced accommodation together. Mm. And it's like, who's doing what? We're just doing it together. Yeah, we'll decide that down the line. Yeah, so (laughs) how many units have you got? We've got three units. How how are you getting on with them? 
They're quite lazy, actually. They're not really doing yeah. anything. You, yeah. You're an idiot. Yeah. You're an yeah. idiot. We, I, the only way I would recommend doing joint ventures to begin with is on a deal-by-deal deal basis. So let's say we That's were going to buy... That's the only way I've ever done joint ventures. It's like, look, we'll buy this property together. You're bringing X, Y, Z to the table. Yep. I'm bringing A, B, C to the table. It could be money or whatever it is. We'll draw up a contract for this deal and this deal only. Yeah. And then that Anyth- is it. Anything else outside of that doesn't count. No, we do all do our own stuff. Right yeah. outside of that, it's completely. Yeah, that's exactly how I do. I mean, one of my investors, we've done three good sized deals together, and we've got three contracts. Each the second contract refers back to the first contract, and the third to the second. So every time you do a deal with them, it's a new contract. Yes, yeah. and we just put that property in. We again say what well, who's doing X Y Z, who's doing A B C, um, and then that way there's no arguments. Yeah. But I do believe as well that no matter what you put in that contract. You can cover probably 99.9% of eventualities, but there's always a chance that something's going to crop up that you've not put in the contract, especially when you're new into it, when you're both new into it. But, but another thing you should put into it, I mean, it's a bit different if you're buying a property together because it's very different. Di- but if you were to do that, say, doing rent to rents, for example, or something, especially when it's a business-related deal, what's your exit strategy? And that's another thing that no one puts in. So if... Mm. It, and, and now is the time to decide, right? Now is the time. So if, for example, let's say me and you teamed up to do rent to rents. If after a year, I turned around to you and said, I don't want to work with you anymore. I just don't like you. You're a bit of a dick, right? Let's say, for example... Ouch, man. You keep making mistakes, right? <laughs> let's say. What, do, what happens now? Because by the time I've got to the point where I'm so fed up with you, yeah. that I've had to turn around and say that, yeah, we're not going to have a reasonable conversation. Exactly. At this point, yeah, right? we're then referring back to the contract, and if there's nothing in the contract, we're then just knocking on wood. Yeah. So uh, one of my favourite ones is what we call a push and pull agreement. So how that works is I would turn, I would turn, if I'm the one that wants out, I will turn around to you and I will offer to buy you out. But here's the deal: when I offer to buy you out, you can either accept my offer. Or you can buy me out for the amount Same. that I offered to buy yeah, you. Yeah, I've heard of this before. Right, yeah. so it means I'm not going to turn around and go. I'll give you. I'll give you. I give you fifty quid. Yeah, yeah. It, because it's like. And then if I if I then said, no, but I will buy you out. Have you legally then got to yeah. accept regardless? That's what the contract says. Yeah, yeah. So right. I've got to put it to you in writing. Yeah. My offer. And then you've got yeah. seven days to think about wow. it. And then yeah. you let me know which way you want to go with it. And that is it. That's good. I mean, I think we've put in ours that if we decided to um, to sell, that we can't sell until the cash investor has made back a minimum, or, or should I say, I can't request a sell until the cash investor has done a minimum of double their money. Meaning, if they've put 150 grand into a deal until they've made 300 grand back, I can't even say I want to sell it. And then after that, we then if one of us wants to sell and the other don't, we either have to buy each other out or we have to just sell if we don't agree. Um, but I like that idea. Yeah. That's it's, good. It's good, isn't it? Do you know what yeah. it, it reminds me when I was when I was kids, me and Samuel, so like if there was like one biscuit left, my mom used to have the rule, she'd go, right, Russell, you break it in half and then Samuel, you get to pick which half. Yeah. So when I'm breaking the biscuit <laughs> in half, right, I'm trying to make it exact. as damn exact yeah. as possible so that when he picks it's like oh there's no difference to that one yeah. if, I, if i mess it up if i break <laughs> it and it's like oh no oh no that's a 60 percent of that is i know yeah, for what you were getting 60%. the small bit yeah exactly so yeah your yeah, mom's smart you should let her do your business deal oh, i should get her in as a mentor yeah, or something definitely. yeah it should be that would be good <laughs> all right so yeah joint ventures though all nearly we obviously run pims property mm-hmm. investors mediation service N- nearly all of the problems with the issues between people are joint ventures it's joint ventures where guess what not they're not a contract yeah get a contract get clarity they've had a few wines at night and they've come up with a great idea I mean, and they're best pals with yeah. best pals but are you best pals when it all goes wrong if you are even if you're friends when I went into into business with Samuel we spent months going back and forth doing the contract who's going to do what, what yeah what, months you don't know really. what's around the corner do you Exactly. You that. might be best friends this week, and then next week, you sworn enemies. I hope not, but maybe. <laughs> maybe. I'm All taking right. Samuel's side. <laughs> <laughs> um, number seven, 
Um, this is a big one. Kind of, it's similar to trying to find the perfect property, but just not taking action. Not looking for deals, not being procrastinating. Lazy. Just being lazy. Yeah, the amount yeah. of people I see that are interested, oh yeah, I want to do property. Yeah. I think these people just don't really want it. They like to think they do. They come to the seminars. They, see, you know, they like to talk about property. They post it on their Instagram, but they're not actually making any moves. They're either lazy or they're scared. Do you know what I think it is? I think most procrastination, if they're coming to the se seminars and stuff, I, I think they're probably not lazy. They probably do want it. Mm. I think most people procrastinate because they don't know what they should do. I think it's a lack. guidance. It's a lack. It's, it's, do you know, you'll, you'll know this, right? When you've got work to do, I bet you if you've got a list, you've got some emails to go through, you've got some things, the bet the things that you put off the most are the things where it's a ch challenge. You don't actually know what. Actually, because of your mum, I don't do that anymore. Okay. Your mum recommended a book to me called Eat That Frog by Brian Tracy. And it's all about like procrastination and basically making lists. Mm. And it refers back to eat that frog is basically... Do something horrible that you don't yeah, want to do. Do the, the horrible first stuff thing. first. And I always think about that book. So I've got like, I've got a whiteboard at home and I put all my tasks on that I need to do. Everything. Not like massive tasks, but just day-to-day -day tasks. Like go to the loo. Yeah. F fix the plumbing on fix the toilet. Fix the toilet flush button yeah. in Samuel's house. Things like that. Um, it's like a normal thing to and have. And then I'll rate it, which is high, low, medium uh, priorities. Yeah. And I will always start with the highs, especially the, f the worst one I don't want to do. So, so you'll, go, you'll start so with the highest easier. priority. Yes. Not necessarily the hardest task. Usually I will go with the hardest task, definitely. But I will only put maybe a, a day's worth of high priority tasks on. I'll not like put that's high, that's high, that's high. I'm like, right, what's high today? So this has got to get done. That's got to get done. And then I'm on them. So then your day gets easier because as you get tired throughout the day, you don't then, if you wouldn't want to do them tasks first thing in the morning. You ain't going to want to do them later. You're not going to do them later, are you? So do you not make that mistake anymore? I've never made that mistake. But hold on. But you said that I would say, I after would... speaking to my mom and reading Eat That Frog, you stop, you change, completely revolutionise the way that you... I would never tasks. say I were a massive procrastinator, but yeah. I would be one that would like to... I'd look at the tasks and I'd think, that's a nice, easy task, I'll do that. That's a nice, easy task, I'll do that. And then it'd get to end of the day and then I'd have the big task to do. And I'd still do them. But then when you're tired and then you finish the day on a negative because you're like, oh, I didn't want to do that. Why am I doing this? And the, but then when you do it the other way around, and then you finish on the nice, easy tasks, and then mm. you look at your board and it's wiped off, because there's no better feeling for me. I know it sounds a little bit sad, but my whiteboard, I've got a little rubber, a, uh, magnetic rubber to it, and when I've done a task and I wipe it off, it just gives me that nice feeling inside. I think that's, that's gone. I don't ever have to look at that again, depending nice. on what it is, obviously. Yeah. And then as I, as I go on the day and, it, and I break it down... Um, Makes but, you feel a little warm and fuzzy inside. Yeah. That's yeah. good. That's good. Yeah. Thank you, Mrs. Leeds. That's good. So he used to he used to make mistakes of it, but he's learned he's learned over time and now <laughs> and, now, and, now, and now he doesn't. Do you know do you know another reason I think people procrastinate? I think people are scared of they don't want to make mistakes. I'm scared of failure. Scared of failure. And if you're scared of success. Some people are scared of success. I was scared of success when I first started. Go on, tell me about that. Um, because when you become successful, you inevitably um, change. And I liked the person I was before. Um, really? Yeah, I believe it or not. Um, and you see less of your old friends, family as well. And then the more successful you get, you, you inevitably start moving in different circles. Oh, I just can't relate to that at all. Because you were born with a silver spoon in your mouth, Russell. <laughs> <laughs> but it scared me a little bit, success. Um, really? I always knew I was going to be successful, always. But it scared you? Well, I don't understand I, that. But I kind of like, I think I held back from it for a while because I was just, I liked where I was. I got a good life, we got decent money, we got good friends and, you know, but I got more bikes. Want, why would you not want more success? Nice I house. do know. Now that I've let that let open that gate, it's just snowballing now. Um, but it took me a long time to, to open that gate. I was like early 30s before I realised, what am I doing? Mm. Laid under somebody's toilet, fixing it for £60 an hour. I was just like, what, what am I doing here? Yeah. And then I just thought, right, now it's time to go. And you just have to let go of that person who you used to be, I'm afraid. Yeah. See, I don't even think I've changed, though. 
I don't, I don't feel that, like, as I've become more successful, mm. I'm still the exact same person. I don't feel like You I've were changed. born smart, though. I had to get smart. Okay. There's a compliment in there somewhere. Oh, uh, it sounds like it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a minute ago, I was born with a silver spoon <laughs> on my Warsaw yeah, Council estate. You, you were, you were, Mind you, do you know what? I was going to I was gonna go, mate, a silver spoon. I was born, I lived in a house with no carpets, Warsaw Council estate. Yeah. Like how ca- and then I remembered that you're from Barnsley. Exactly. So I probably, in comparison. Yeah, you were a billionaire. It's all relative. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, talking of not talk, talking of being scared of making mistakes though, and scared of failure, I think a lot of people are scared of failure. Um, I actually think failure is a really good thing. Yeah, and that moves you us only our, make that mistake once, usually, unless you're an idiot. Number eight, not learning from mistakes. Mm. If you're making mistakes, I think it's interesting because um, I've read lots of books actually about how when you when you fail, that's how you get good. That's it's by making mistakes. That's the learning. If as long as you do it in the right way, when you make mistakes and you learn, and you're like, okay, so like, even look at any. In, you inventor. do have to minimise these mistakes, though. Do you? What about like, um, what about the uh, Thomas Edison? How many mis- how many failures did he have to create the light bulb? What about eleven hundred and? Can't, it was something ridiculous, wasn't yeah. it? Every time he made a mistake. There's a, there's a brilliant book actually about this I'm going to recommend to you, James. Okay. It's going to change your life even more than Eat That Frog. Okay. It's called Black Box Thinking. Black Box Thinking. Right, it's by a guy called Matthew Syed. And I love his books. He's also written a brilliant book called Bounce. But Matthew Syed, Black Box Thinking. And basically what it's about is this. On aeroplanes, making a mistake, pretty costly, right? If you make a mistake yeah. on an aeroplane, you're in a lot of trouble, right? <laughs> so they have a black box that records everything. Ah, in the yeah, room, yeah. Right? And then they learn from that mistake at a heavy cost. Any issues with the flight, any problems, it's like, let's analyse in detail why did that happen? Why do we make a mistake? Mm. There's not a, it's not a point the finger, there's not a blame game to society. It's just yeah. like, how can we learn from this for the future? They look at it, they analyse it, they go, right, maybe we try this, maybe we try that. And they experiment and they... Through experimentation and science, they improve. And as a result, airlines have become one of the safest modes of transport on the planet because every mistake is analysed mm. and new systems are brought in to stop it from happening again. Yeah. Compare that with something like the NHS. Right? I can't remember the stats. But they talk about it in the book. But the amount of people that die from mistakes made mm. by the NHS is astronomical, right? They make loads of mistakes. When they make a mistake... They don't admit fault. They cover it up. Yep. They, 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 don't, learn, they don't learn from it. Mm. So, obviously, making mistakes is not good, but if you've got, a, like, a scientific, analytical mind to, oh, okay, that didn't work, why did that not work? And yeah. you analyse it, you will learn, you'll grow so much. So, so you're saying I've got a scientific mind then because the mistakes I've made, I've only made once. Well, yeah. I think you have. You must yeah. have. You, yeah. You're probably not even thinking about it, but your natural yeah. smarts Thank you. <laughs> that, you, that you've learned. Um, yeah, you like, okay, I messed up there. Yeah. How can I, how can I not yeah. let that happen But again? I do think you need to minimise them to start with. There were mistakes that I've made throughout my property investing career that I definitely could have avoided easily. Um, but you don't know what you don't know, do you? No. You don't know what questions to ask when you're new. You don't. Um... It's like people will say, well, all the information's out there for free. Yeah, it is, but if you don't even know what question to ask to get to that information... And the problem is, while well, informa- a lot of the information is there out for free, there's also... A lot of shit. A lot of misinformation. Yes. We're, we're, in, we're, in the, we're in, living in a world now of like misinformation and over-information. Mm. There's too much information. So yeah. finding the, the nuggets mm. is like finding a needle in a haystack. Yeah. Which brings us on to our next point, nicely. Uh, not seeking professional advice. Trying to do everything on your What own. kind of professionals? I'd say lo- lots of professionals. So I would say, number one, um, property trainers. Yeah. Like what we've both paid totally agree, for yeah. property training. But number two, I would say you want to use you want to use solicitors when you draw no. the contract. You, you don't use a solicitor for your contract. I use them, but I will instruct them. Um, I'm, I'm very anti-solicitor. You want to use an accountant for your tax advice. You want to go and speak to a tax saver, tax account. You want to make the most. You want to speak to. A, you want to use a mortgage broker. Don't just go and get a mortgage from your bank. Speak yeah. to a broker that can find you the a best good deal. Broker. A good broker. You, you want to be using these people that should be in your power team. 
you've got to have a power team like this, yeah. But then I, again, I think you should also know 80% of their job. You should know what they, the stages are that they have to do. As you should well. know that. I always think that you should know enough to have an intelligent conversation with them, right? Agreed. So like when I'm speaking to my tax advisor or my accountants, I can throw an idea. I, I need to know enough that I can throw an idea at them. Could we try it like this? Could we structure it like this? But then I'll bow to their superior knowledge if they're like, no, you can't. Oh, yes, you can. Okay, great. Mm. But you, you want to be able to argue the task. You want to be able to look at things from you. Because at the end of the day, no one cares about your business like you care about your business. Correct. So if you just outsource it, so, uh, I, was what I used to do when I first set up my uh, business. It was like literally put all my receipts into a paper bag, go and dump them at my accountant's door and go... I only stopped doing that last year. Did you? <laughs> and go, sort it, right? Yeah. It's like... That's your job, man. Sand. A lot of people <laughs> do it with marketing. If they hire a marketing person, just sort my marketing. Yeah. Here you go, agency. Here's 3,000 photos. Pick the best one. Yeah, or, or even not. <laughs> just, use, just use AI. Put it on, put it on chat to you, <laughs> right, But you, you want to be uh, aware. You want to be able to have an intelligent conversation. You yeah. want to know what the KPIs are. You want to be able to yeah. hold them to account. But you still need the expert. You still need the professionals yeah. to help you. Sadly, you. yeah. As much as our, our slate solicitors, we do need them, don't we? Unfortunately, we do. Yeah, and they do. Uh, they do get the job done eventually. Um, oh, they're definitely slow. Yeah. But if you know the job, like you're saying, if you know enough to have an intelligent conversation with them, if they're being slow, then you know, hey, you're being slow here. This should take yeah. this long. And this it, should be the process. I think as you pro as you progress as well with your own knowledge in them areas. Generally and usually, you'll you'll get new power teams. Yeah. Because like when I think back to when I first started, my power team were not very powerful. Um, just whereas, a team. It was just a team of <laughs> idiots. <laughs> whereas now I've like because now I know what the process is and probably eighty percent of what their job is anyway. I, I I then could make a decision and think that person's not right for what where I'm going. Uh, so I've had to let them go. Yeah. I mean, I am on my fourth, maybe fifth accountant now. How many solicitors? Probably about the same. Yeah. I've maybe, you're, one maybe you're the idiot. it's me. Yeah, it's me. <laughs> uh, Do you know, like, when, when someone thinks everyone's yeah, a dick? It's everybody it's like, else. Every, <laughs> everyone of me is a dick. Um... <laughs> Yeah, um, the solicitor I've got at minute, to be fair, is is decent. He's a little bit slow, uh, but he's 63, I think. So, Do you think that's old? He's an old 63. I hope he's not watching this. <laughs> <laughs> but he's an old 63. Um, Just say this was filmed like two years ago. <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was solicitor number four. Yeah, but no, I've, I've got a good team behind me now. Um, I wouldn't change them, who I've got... Um, and it's very important to to have them knowing what what your goals are and and where you're going because they can make things very easy for you or very difficult. Yeah, yeah, no, I I agree, I agree. So yeah, so what what is possible to learn a lot on your own? Get them advice from professionals mm. can help. And like we mentioned earlier, learning from their mistakes as well, uh, and educating yourself, you know, and doing your proper due diligence. Mm. And then number ten, this is the the final one. We've made we've made it through the first nine. And I've made two mistakes up to now. I don't think you'll have made this mistake, but this is a mistake you'll see an awful lot. Okay. And especially with property. And I think the reason is, because I think a lot of people get into property and their attitude is passive income, really easy. And they don't do this, which is treat it as a business. Because mm. you've got to remember, property investing, it is a business. And while you can create a passive income, the setup process, learning how to do it correctly, how actually investing correctly, it's a business. You've got to treat it as a business. You need to look at your systems. You need to be professional when you're dealing with your tenants or your agencies or whatever it is. You've got to treat it as a business. Don't just think, oh, yeah, it's a passive income, a little side hustle. I hate the word side hustle, actually. I don't know what you think of side hustle. Yeah, it's not a side hustle, is it? It's, I mean, even if you try and treat it as a side hustle to start with, it, it's, if, especially if you're doing it properly, it soon becomes, it just engulfs your life, doesn't it, property investing? Yeah. Um, I don't think anybody can be massively successful in property and do it as a side hustle. Um, and if they are, they're not reaching the potential. But I think everybody originally um, makes that mistake of not treating it like a business and not outsourcing things and not having the right team behind them. Uh, obviously, a big one to start with cost. You know, you can't afford to always get 
people doing the little day-to-day tasks for you that really you shouldn't be doing. But mm. to start with, you've got to do, haven't you? Because yeah, of course. you've got to get involved in every aspect of the business to start with. One, even just to know how it actually works. Because you can't just, like, right, I'm going to be a property investor. Here's my team. I'm going to set... I'm going to set a PA on at 28 grand a year. I'm going to set a management team up that's going to look after this. And, and you've got no real income. You've got to get involved in it all. But I think as the business grows, if you don't then start treating it like a business and stepping back from things. I think one of the hardest things for me was when I had to just realize and accept that nobody, like you said earlier, nobody's going to do a task in your business as well as you would. No one's going to care as much as you. Yeah, yeah. because they, it's not their business. They're an employee, and you've got to remember that. Like, when I used to be a gas plumber, um, I went through, like, probably, I had three or four apprentices in space of three or four years, because I was like, they just don't care, these apprentices. They're just, the van's messy, and they're, they're not putting shoe covers on when we go in the house. And But I didn't realise then that, actually, they're not, bothered nah. they're just an employee it was my business well they're there just to really learn from you yeah they're probably in as easy as possible just want to get qualified yeah they don't give a t- toss about you or your business really uh, yeah. have, you, have you have you ever not been self-employed did you, did you ever work as an apprentice yes or? i yeah i were an apprentice for a local council for a local when council. i first started yeah and i bet i were a dick yeah yeah i can imagine <laughs> You haven't changed a bit, have you? No, no, but no. And I think back, I mean, people used to say that to me when I was complaining about my apprentices and they were like, this is karma coming back to you. (laughs) And I was like, yeah. And I used to say, yeah, but I wouldn't employ somebody like I was at 17. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, but you probably would if you were paying them three pounds an hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, But yeah, I think as long as you start learning to step back from things and delegate it, if you want to grow that is... You know, some people can get to three, four, five grand a, a month coming in and they're working nearly every other day or, or every day and they may be happy with that and and think, well, I don't need to outsource anything because I've, I've hit that five grand a month and But even, I'm even then, though, you, should, you should still treat it as a business. You should still put the time, the effort, the respect that it deserves. Even if you're not outsourcing, you know, so, loads of sole traders, they've still got to treat it as a business. Yeah. You know, not it's not just a little a uh, little flutter on the side. It's mm. it's it's a, it's a business. Yeah, it needs the the love, the effort, the work, the time. Th- this then goes back to people not taking action because you, I think you've you've got to be, you've got to decide. I, I I don't see how anybody can do it as a side hustle. You've got to decide if property's for you or not, and if you want to do it full time because it is a full time job. Yeah, and if you do do it, it's one of the most lucrative, best professions. You Massively, can get involved in. there's some great days I have. There's some bad days as well. Don't get me wrong; it's a difficult business to navigate. But I never ever lay in bed at night and think, "I wish I'd stayed plumbing." No, nah. never. It's the best thing I've ever done. Um, but also one of the hardest things I've done. But I have scaled fast, faster than you probably should, if I'm honest. Um, ah, you can't scale too I fast. Know. I need that yacht. Yeah, <laughs> exactly that. <laughs> well, guys, hope you enjoyed the show. They are the biggest 10 mistakes that beginner property investors, or not even beginner, general property investors tend to make. Hope you found that really useful. I've been Russell Leeds. And I'm James Ewell. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>